Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's School Safety Advisory Board meeting. I'm Dr. Michael Martirano, Superintendent of Schools for the Howard County Public School System, and I also serve as the chair of this advisory board. Uh, it is now 10 o'clock, and I will now call this meeting to order. I also want to verify before we start that I want to confirm that the meeting is being live streaming and is being recorded. Can I confirm that? Yes, we are live streaming and recording. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now begin with a roll call of our board members uh, to check for our quorum. I'm going to start uh, in order here today. Catherine Klossmeyer. Klossmeyer. Hi, good morning. Uh, Senator wasn't uh, able to make it, but I'm a, her legislative director here on her behalf. Thanks, Thank Chair. Eric Ebersol. Karen Bailey. Present. Good morning, Karen. Dr. Kelly Anderson. Pamela Gaddy. I am here. Good morning, Pamela. Good morning. Laurel Moody. Good morning, I'm here. Good morning, Laurel. Claire Cabral. Our student rep, Claire. Dr. Tia McKinnon. Here. Good morning. Good morning. Sheriff Matthew Crisofoli. Chief Paul Kiefer. Good morning. I'm here. Good morning, Chief. Dave Engel. Detective Lawrence E. Smith. Dr. Shannon, Sharon A. Hoover, excuse me. Wow. Dr. Hoover. Megan Berger. Good morning, I'm here on behalf of Megan Berger. Okay, thank you. Scott Tiffin. Michael Brown. James T. Bell. Good morning, I'm here. Good morning, Mr. Bell. Captain Patrick D. Herring. Thomas E. Alban. I'm present, thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, Lee Nadane Oppenheim. And just for the purposes of our role, we do have three vacant positions. Uh, with this notation of our roll call, I need to make certain that we have a quorum. Uh, so I want to welcome Mr. Dunklow. Please confirm that we have a quorum, sir. Uh, by my count, I think including you, did we have 10 members present? I believe so. That's what my count is. And Kate, can you verify? Yeah, that's my count as well. And did you say you had three vacancies? So 24 is down to 21. So that would put us at 10 out of 21, when, which is just shy of a quorum. I mean, we can do informational items. You just wouldn't be able to take any votes until others jump on. Okay. Yeah, I knew it was close there with, with that number. So let's just be cognizant of that. So I'm going to continue with our business. Uh, the, the last, and Mr. Dunklow, please advise me of anything that I get close to that. I don't believe any, there are any action items uh, regarding this. Uh, so let's continue. Thank the you. last meeting of the advisory board was in December. Uh, the December meeting was recorded and that recording is available on the MCSS website. As such, there are no meeting minutes uh, to be approved. Um, so at, at this moment, I'm, Want to make certain that we had reviewed our agenda and want to see if there are any additions to today's agenda. Seeing none that there are no additions, I do need a motion uh, to approve the agenda. This is Tom, so moved. Okay. Do we have a second? Chief Kiefer, I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, any opposed or any abstentions? 
Thank you. The motion passes. The agenda for today is approved. Let's continue with our uh, agenda for today. And we will begin our meeting uh, today, members, with an update on proposed legislation related to school safety. The legislative session is in full motion right now. And uh, Kim Buckheit, who is the MCSS Policy and Communication and Engagement Manager, will lead us in this discussion. Uh, so let's, Kim, if you would, uh, welcome and thank you uh, for providing this overview today. Thank you, Dr. Monterano. And um, I'll be joined for any technical questions that I can't answer um, by Mr. Dunklow. Uh, so just a quick overview. We're going to go through those pieces, those bills that we've been watching most closely at MCSS as they um, impact the work of the sub cabinet, ourselves at MCSS, as well as LEAs related to school safety. Um, so just a couple of reminders, March 20th is the crossover date um, and April 10th is the end of our session, the cyan die time. Uh, so the first one, uh, House Bill 203 is related to reporting arrest of students. Um, this is a uh, prior bill was in our uh, prior session, uh, particularly then for uh, impact on MCSS would be that it actually requires MCSS to start um, gathering data that we currently don't. We currently don't collect any um, personally identifiable information related to particular students. So uh, if this bill does move forward, that will require MCSS to um, look at a data management system and uh, method by which we begin to collect that. That would be a new collection for us. Uh, House Bill 515 has been interesting. We've been, um, have been really fortunate to engage with uh, Delegate Solomon in uh, looking at how this bill um, moves forward with some amendments. And we did um, give it a favorable report with amendments, both in writing and um, in person. So specifically, it, um, it has impact upon everybody. Uh, so uh, MSDE will, uh, so may collaborate with the sub cabinet to adopt active shooter drill regulations. Uh, this language actually remains the same in terms of what has been um, in prior, the prior regulation. What's uh, most kind of um, significant for us to talk about is MCSS will be tasked with collecting survey data from LEAs, and I'll speak to kind of what that looks like um, below for the LEA. Uh, based the using the data that we gather, we would then be partnering with a third party to provide that data for a third party to really look at the impact upon um, active shooter drill scenarios upon students, staff, um, and parents. So what impact those activities have upon those individuals. Um, and then also what is new within this bill is that we would be collaborating with MSDE to develop some model content for safe gun storage. Um, and that would really look like developing model content that is then pushed out to LEAs um, for them to be able um, to distribute to individuals, um, to their constituents uh, annually. On the LEA side, what's um, really substantial in this is that it prohibits the use of any kind of sensory simulation um, in a drill that occurs within a school environment. So if there is a drill that's happening during the school day when students and staff are present, um, it would not allow, it prohibits the use of anything that would mimic active uh, or gunfire, um, individuals replicating a situation of an active assailant type of dynamic. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't preclude law enforcement agencies from doing those things outside of the typical school day. So it doesn't on a Saturday when students and staff aren't present or during the summer when students and staff aren't present, doesn't mean that law enforcement can't be doing drills and using um, some active or some simulated type of things. But when students and staff are present, it would prohibit the use of any simulations. Um, 
It also requires notification to parents before and after drills. So this would also be new. As a matter of practice, some LEAs and schools may be doing this, but it would require schools and systems to notify parents, students and staff in advance um, of drills. Um, and then it also requires the, the collection of data. So following drills, uh, following an active assailant type of situation, um, drill that uh, staff would be prompted, students would be prompted to complete some type of survey information that then MCSS would collect and forward to this third party. So really looking at um, what is the impact of these upon individuals, um, as well as kind of the effectiveness of these uh, drills. So there's definitely a number of things in 515 that we're watching. Um, and 515 actually has been given a favorable report um, by the House Committee, so should be moving forward to the Senate. Uh, the next one is Senate Bill 799. This is the um, Cyber uh, Safety Guide. So uh, is requiring MCSS to collaborate with a host of uh, state agency partners to jointly develop a cyber safety guide. Um, and it's specific would include guidance on safe internet, social media, technology usage for um, students, parents, and staff. Uh, and the um, intention is that that would be made available to folks for the 24-25 school year. Um, so a little bit of a time allowed in there for that to happen. 811, so Senate Bill 811 um, may look familiar. Uh, Delegate Washington uh, used to, uh, actually Senator Washington used to be Delegate Washington, has proposed elements of this in the past um, in the House. Uh, it adds some additional elements to it. So uh, Senate Bill 811 specifically is um, would require MCSS to make updates to the school law portion of our uh, SRO training. On the LEA side, there's some interesting elements. Um, this piece of legislation has um, historically in the past uh, looked at reducing the disproportionality ratio, uh, discipline disproportionality to 2.0 for those that are familiar with that um, initiative. Uh, it um, also requires that SROs are not involved in discipline-related um, interactions at the school, at, within a school environment. Um, and what is new, though, within this, um, this particular iteration from Senator Washington is this, this kind of last section here. So it very specifically defines this thing called a behavior health and safety plan. And the requirement is that any school that has a SRO assigned to it or a school security employee employed at the school, the school must have a behavior health and safety plan um, on record. And uh, so even before an SRO SSE would be assigned, this safety plan must be developed. Within 811, it very specifically defines the requirements of what me, must, must be included inside of this safety plan. Um, so 811's hearing is on the 14th of this month. Um, so we'll just keep an eye on where that goes. House Bill 738. Um, is, uh, so again, a hearing coming up, but it's looking at increasing grant funds uh, for our, for the SRO adequate uh, law enforcement coverage, um, basically doubling funds. So from going from 10 million to 20 million um, is, is what this bill looks at. So definitely would impact the amount of money available to all LEAs, as well as money that MCSS is um, looking at distributing and assisting with. Senate Bill 677 um, is also another interesting uh, bill. The hearing for that occurred last week. Um, it is uh, looking at installing a panic system in all schools across the state. 
So a panic button button system that would be directly connected to all 911 boards. Um, uh, so a very large lift, it would uh, primarily MCSS is identified as the agency that would be um, both uh, procuring and training and doing all that needs to happen to put this into place and make it happen. Um, it requires LEAs to share floor plans, emergency plans, and geolocation addresses. Um, but MCSS is the primary agency uh, with this. There is funding inside of this bill um, in terms of being able to purchase and use this. We um, we did write a, um, a, a we did submit a written response that was favorable with amendments. Was really our recommendation. Currently, the timeline on this is that. Literally all of these systems happen by uh, the beginning of the new school year. Uh, so by September 1 of this year. So, you know, less than six months now uh, for us to do all the things we need to do to make that happen. Um, so what we have proposed is uh, a summer work study is to bring all the different people together that would be involved in making this happen um, to actually kind of look at the effective methods by which we could. Um, we agree that this is something that would be very valuable, uh, but want to make sure that we can do it in an effective manner. House Bill 180. Kim, can Go I ahead. pause you just for a second? Can yeah. you flip back a slide? So I just want to jump in. Um, so we worked very closely with the Department of Emergency Management, which is where the 911 board sits. We also had conversations with subcommittees at MACO, on this, um, and we were all in alignment with what our recommendation to the sponsor of the bill is, and that would be this summer study that Kim was speaking to. Um, so really aggressive timing, really unreasonable timing. Um, it probably also is important for this group to understand that there are several uh, of our school systems that actually already have um, panic button systems in place. Um, this, the way the bill is drafted, our estimation is that there's probably only two vendors that meet the requirements of this bill, and neither of them are ones being used currently in school systems that we're aware of for this feature. Um, so a lot of concerns, a lot of challenges on implementation, um, getting them within each of the 911 centers, um, so just definitely something for anyone in the public school system realm um, or emergency response realm to just be aware of that this is on deck. But just so just so you all know, um, all believe we believe that a summer study would be actually a good idea. We're willing to lead it, um, but the implementation as it's written would be incredibly problematic for everyone. Thanks, Kate. And Mr. Chair, I just want to let you know that it looks like we have reached a quorum. We had a, another member uh, jump on. So we have a, a 11 of the 21 members serving. Thank you, Mr. Dunklow. Appreciate that. All right, House Bill 185 has actually also crossed over already. This um, prohibits the use of corporal punishment in um, all non-public, uh, private, and um, child care centers. So. Uh, we uh, did not uh, do a written um, support of this in the first uh, hearing, but we are planning in this second hearing to do a written response saying that we are um, in support of prohibiting the use of corporal punishment. Senate Bill 938. Um, is related to uh, funding also creates kind of the opportunity for um, funding to be used to expand the use of the types of things that uh, funding can be used for. So um, aligns with the uh, previous piece of legislation with the doubling of the amount of money, the appropriation that would go for our school safety um, initiatives. Uh, but adds the uh, use of resolving disputes. So looking at mediation types of services to be something that money can be allocated to be used for as well. 
Um, it also allows, so I'll also, also ask Kate to jump in on this one a little bit, um, was it adds the requirement for um, MCSS to be coordinating with MSDE and IEC to review um, the state of physical security every two years and promulgate guidelines. So Kate, if you could maybe clarify for everybody like what the current practice is related to that. I know you understand that a little better than I right now. Yeah, and we'll, we'll go through that um, in the next piece. Um, but currently in 2019, the Safe to Learn Act required that every um, public school have a facility assessment um, done in June of 2019. So those were done. The summary of those uh, assessments were provided to MCSS. Um, we put together a um, sort of an overarching um, list for the sub cabinet so that they knew as they um, were approving school safety grants, uh, sort of where the, the physical um, security gaps might be. Um, there are some existing uh, guidelines that the IAC has specific to construction related uh, items, physical security for construction. Um, this would uh, require a, what I would consider probably a more extensive uh, guideline be, be developed. Um, so once, and it would require uh, the three entities, so our office, the department, as well as the IAC, to review um, the facility assessments that are conducted by each of the schools every two years, um, which currently the statute does not uh, dictate how often those facility assessments are done. Um, this would require those facility, this would require us and the sub cabinet to develop regulations that would require them to be conducted every two years so that then we could review um, every two years the physical security um, in each of the school systems or each of the education agencies, and then um, update any guidelines that we have related to physical security elements in the school. Um, so I will also say that the, the funding piece, um, so as Kim mentioned, it increases from 10 to 20 million. Um, but the appropriation for the 10 million currently in the Safe to Learn Act is just for SROs and adequate coverage in the year that it's appropriated. Um, this would make it $20 million and it would make SRO and adequate coverage one of the, what would now be 12 elements that are eligible under the Safe Schools Fund grant. Um, so it would mean an increase in, to 20 million, it would mean the 10 categories that are currently allowed, <clears throat> that the funds are currently allowed to be used for, or SROs and adequate coverage, or the mediation piece. Yeah, so just to, so it's one we're really watching closely. And again, we uh, were fortunate to be able to have some interactions with Senator Hester early on, um, but it currently is still in the first reading uh, in the Senate Rules uh, Committee. So we've just been watching to see how that may move. Um, House Bill 849 um, actually was one that we wrote a letter of opposition for. Um, it was uh, specific to Montgomery County um, stop arm cameras. So basically violators um, within certain conditions of four lane highways, certain situations um, would be given a um, free pass on the first offense. And we don't agree with any free passes for passing buses when you shouldn't. Um, Senate Bill 340, House Bill 745 um, is one that really kind of directly connects to um, one of your, our, our work groups we'll be talking about in this next hour, uh, but it is related to um, the uh, threats and swatting, so false statements, this Anti-Swatting Act of 2023. Um, uh, it has, so current status, both the Senate, the Senate hearing occurred in February, as well as the House hearing. Um, there hasn't been any kind of updated status posted um, just yet related to that. 
Uh, we didn't specifically take a position in the uh, first round of hearings, but um, would definitely consider probably in the second round, seeing what happens. Uh, Senate Bill 935 um, is very specific to Baltimore City, or Baltimore City um, police officers, school resource officers um, related to being able to carry a firearm. Um, it is definitely a local bill. We don't plan to necessarily take a specific position one way or the other on that one. And actually, the last one I'm going to let Mr. Dunklow um, weigh in on. This is one that my uh, uh, school administrator brain has a hard time wrapping itself around. <laughs> um, so I'm going to pass it off to Mr. Dunklow. Sure. Um, so, the, so the sense I get from this bill is that there's a current prohibition on willful disturbance uh, or willfully preventing the orderly conduct of activities within your um, elementary, secondary, and higher ed schools. Um, this exempts uh, from the penalties in that section, students who are currently attending those schools or students who are attending another school but are participating at a extracurricular sporting event at the school where the offense occurs. And so the sense I get is that um, th the goal would be to, to move this out of what would be criminal penalties to sort of more of a school discipline focus. Those are the um, those are the specific bills that we've been watching closely um, and responding to. Are there others uh, potentially that folks would um, like some feedback from any of us, uh, particularly Mr. Dunklow uh, is with us also? Uh, Kim, this is Tom Alvin and not really an additional bill, but I would just ask, um, you know, first of all, I appreciate all that uh, the center does for non-public schools. I was just disappointed to see specifically that issue related to quote unquote the panic button situation applies only to public schools. And I'm sure Kate runs for me once in a while because she knows I'm coming down the hall to talk to her about how can <laughs> we how can we include non-public schools in the notification process? Because, you know, we're really out of the loop. And anything either that you all can do to advocate for non-public or if we can at least somehow be considered, if we can tag along with this project, if it's not a significant cost um, to put it into place. But to me, I think regardless of where a child is educated, you know, they're all valuable and we shouldn't uh, exclude this opportunity for our non-public school children and staff, so. Yes, so Tom, I'll jump in. Um, so interesting that you say that there is actually a piece in this legislation that ties directly to private and non-public schools. Um, it's not exactly clear what the intent is. Again, I think there's a lot of challenges and problems with this piece of legislation, but in our conversations with our, our partners at MDEM, the 911 board and, and MAKO in the um, public safety realm is that conversation of, of what was the intent of the bill specific to the privates and non-publics. And it's basically, if you actually look at the bill language, um, which I can send, I can send quickly in the chat to everybody, there is a section on um, the, no, the notifications that a mechanism to notify uh, private and non-public schools. Right. So not, not putting panic buttons, it, it does not seem like it's including panic buttons in your facilities, but at least getting you notification when a PSAP is made aware of an incident at a nearby location. Perfect. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Okay, any other uh, comments? I would just like to double back around on House Bill 811, if I could uh, just briefly do you have a sense of where that is? Is there support for that? We haven't, yeah, we haven't really had any conversations, Dr. Moderano, with anybody related to it. And right, if you were following related bill in previous sessions, right? Um, so I don't know. I can't speak to that specifically. I don't know if Mr. Dunklow or Kate have any other info. The reason I bring it up, it's one of those, you know, sort of boots on the ground issue that I navigate all day long, and I've included that language uh, 
in my SRO MOU uh, so that I hope that if it doesn't even pass, that we can give a nod to it as far as a good practice and how we talk about that in general, but navigating the role of the SRO and the administrator and how that gets blended at times. I've been extremely been very vocal to my own administrators about making sure those lines were very clear and where we were with that. Mm -hmm. But also there's some complications when SROs do see things and they have to get involved. Extremely supportive. Yeah, and Sorry, that's, I think what's interesting in 811, I, there's almost like four sections inside of 811. Yeah. There's the disproportionality ratio, moving that. There's a high suspending school piece, right? Identifying this high suspending school. Those are two separate things. Then there's this third of SROs not being involved with discipline, right? Which which also, again, Kate or Dino, others can correct me. I really feel that within the SRO training, that is something that is discussed and, and really kind of SROs understanding their role and differentiating right. how discipline, school-based discipline, right, occurs separately. And then this fourth element now, which is brand new than, than what any of us, because this has been a bill that I was watching very closely on the MSD side, doing disproportionality stuff for a number of years. The related bill is what's brand new to this language now is the this plan, this behavior, health, and safety plan is something that we hadn't necessarily seen. And it's connected directly to SROs. Um, so it's not necessarily connected to the disproportionality or the high suspending school piece, which is interesting, right? It's hanging on, if you have an SRO, you must have this plan in place. Um, so there's like four big pieces inside of 811. And that's important for you. I really appreciate you explaining it that way, because I'm isolating just that one issue. And I, I just, and also what you said that that is part of the SRO training. So. So thank you for that. Okay, any other comments or questions about any of the overview of which we just received? Good morning. Could we go back to SB 938 really quickly? Sure. I wanted to know, because it appears that the bill beginning in 2025 gives the subcabinet discretion for awarding funds in the grant. Has any thought been given to how the discretion should be exercised? Kate, you want to take that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll ask, was that Peyton? Yes. So Peyton, what, what is the specific question? What do you mean? Discretion. So in the build, it, it seems that starting in 2025, how the funds are going to be awarded is based on the subcabinet's discretion. So when it comes to the disbursement of those funds, has any thought been given to how that discretion will be exercised? Not at this point. So the subcabinet always has discretion under uh, for safe schools fund. Um, in the past, when there was when the um, fund was appropriated ten million dollars, let's take the SRO appropriation separate. Um, there were periods of time when the subcabinet chose to include non-public special education facilities um, in those grants. Um, I do not, I can't say for sure if the subcabinet would consider doing that again. Um, they may. Um, and I think the last time they, they pulled off, I think it was about 5,000 per non-public special education facility. Um, unfortunately for the private schools, there was no appropriation available for them. Um, I will say, if, if that was specific to your question about appropriation for schools, the way the language is written currently, the, the existing $10 million for SROs is broken out um, per school facility. And so it, it, the 10 million breaks out to about $7,000 and change per school. This would increase it to 14,000, assuming the subcabinet didn't pull any portion of the funding to um, provide grants to non-public special education facilities, for example. Does that answer your specific question about the distribution? Yes, it does, thank you. Sure, um, I will say we did have, we didn't bring it up here because it's not, nothing is set in stone until um, the budget bills pass. 
Um, but the governor did include in his budget for MCSS an increase um, in our uh, funding for hate crimes grants. So it went from 2 million to 3 million. Uh, there is a possibility and we hope that the legislature will keep that uh, increase in appropriation. And then there was a um, MCSS uh, will have a 3 million for, um, and hopefully uh, to allow for another grant for uh, local education agencies. Unfortunately, that will not be available to private or non-public schools. Okay. The subcabinet does generally have some autonomy to make um, various types of decisions about how the grants will be administered. Any other comments, members, on the legislation? Okay, I have, I have one one quick comment. Uh, I'm not quite sure the the House bill name because we're going through, and I jumped on a call a little late. Um, but the one, the Baltimore City one, with the with the guns in 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 schools. Yes, uh, nine thirty five. Do we know if uh, that is a bill. I know it's strictly for Baltimore City at this particular time, but do we know if this bill um, could be broadened in the future? Because um, I know that there are other possible school districts where um, this also may apply as well. Is that something that could, could possibly be broadened at some particular point in time? Dr. Moreno-Rano, do you want me to jump in? Yes. Real uh, quick, okay. Um, so nice to see you, Michael. Um, <laughs> so currently there is not a prohibition for law school resource officers to carry firearms with the exception of in Baltimore City. Um, so whether or not they have some local policy that I'm currently not aware of, and I'll let Dino jump in here as well. Um, they're the only jurisdiction um, that does not permit them to carry during the school day is Baltimore City School Police. Um, so Dito, I don't know if there was something else. Yeah, the, when I first came to the center, this was the first project I was assigned to help work on. Baltimore City Schools Police, when they were created, there was a caveat that didn't allow them to carry weapons when they were in the schools. After 9-11, it became a practice to carry. At some point afterwards, it was determined that practice was ongoing and moves were made to rein it back in to the way in parameters of the law. And ever since, this has been a, uh, an ongoing issue there that they've, they've done different programs up there where they'll have assigned SROs check their weapons 30 minutes after school starts into a lockbox in their office. They'll get it 30 minutes before school releases and the remaining of the SROs in the system were moved into community beat teams and they rotate through a school wearing their firearm for no more than 15 minutes at a time, just like a walkthrough check-in, check on patrol. So since that went on, this has been a, uh, a bill that's been introduced since 2015 or 16 when I began. There are no other jurisdictions in Maryland that I know of that have a, a policy where they're forbidding their local SROs from wearing their weapons in. Okay, I know there, there were some other school districts that um, it, it may not be something that is as, as formal as Baltimore City, but I know that um, having them in the building per se all day um, is something that they've kind of worked around. So it's not something where I think it's, it's it's a law, but I know that there's some other school districts that that you know don't. I know I have SRO that's assigned to my building all day, every day with a firearm, but um, you know, I don't think that that's necessarily everywhere. But I was just I was just curious about that. Okay, uh, continuing uh, to move along. Thank you for that comment. Any other uh, comments from our board members? Okay, seeing none, uh, once again, let's thank uh, Ms. Buckheit and Mr. Dunklow for the overview and the comments also made by our director uh, regarding the legislation. Uh, obviously, sine die 
I believe is on April the 10th and there's miles to go before that ends. So we'll need to continue to watch all of this legislation as it advances through as it pertains to our schools uh, overall. Uh, and it's also interesting that uh, a number of these items, as far as the legislation, also have been things that we've discussed as far as recommendations. So I believe in many cases there is some alignment of the conversations that we've had thus far. With all of that, the next item on our agenda is the review of the progress in the meeting requirements uh, defined by the Safe to Learn Act. MCSS Executive Director Kate Bryan and Deputy Director uh, Joseph uh, Pinatero uh, will lead us in this overview. Uh, Director Bryan, please begin the conversation for that. Thank you. Sure, thank you. So everyone received, and I think uh, one of the team has put the link to the document. Um, so I think it's important. We are coming up on the five-year anniversary of the Safe to Learn Act. So the Safe to Learn Act was um, enacted in April of 2018, and it went into effect uh, June 1st of 2018. So a lot of incredible work has been done over the last five years um, by the sub cabinet, by members of the advisory board, um, by our team and by our local education agencies, as well as our private and non-public school partners and school safety partners across the state. Um, so when we presented to the sub cabinet last month, um, we had put together for them sort of a, a five year, four and a half year update of, of where we are with the Safe to Learn Act. Um, so the document that you have includes um, some hyperlinks to many of our, our reports, um, requirements um, that we have developed and that the sub cabinet, MCSS and the advisory board have put together over the last five years. Um, so for the sub cabinet requirements, there are some very, there were some very specific and are some very specific requirements for the sub cabinet. Those include um, administrative requirements. Um, in the document that was shared with you, uh, there's a link to, so that you all have it as well, a link to your advisory board recommendations of 2022. Um, those are that is the document where your work session that you're going to go into next, where those recommendations came from. And as Dr. Monterano mentioned, um, you know, there is definitely some alignment uh, this year with some of the legislation that we're seeing coming out of Annapolis. So that is, that is uh, incredibly uh, telling of the good work that everyone on the advisory board has done over the last five years. So we thank you for all of your help and support. Uh, the sub cabinet also has regulatory responsibility uh, currently. And again, in the document is a link to all of these materials. Um, currently there are uh, five regulations. Two have gone back out for public comment for some changes. Um, those, the public comment period ended uh, last week, last Tuesday. Um, so we are gathering uh, the public comments. We're going to review those and then make a decision of whether or not we um, request that the sub cabinet um, publish the uh, draft or the changed regulations as written, or if we make some additional comments and or changes and send them out for public comment. Um, the state behavioral threat assessment policy, this, so this was a policy that was required by the Safe to Learn Act and established and written and published in 2018. Um, over the course of the last year and a half, uh, another work group has been working on um, impl an implementation guide, which has been finalized, and we are going to be publishing that uh, in the coming weeks. Um, we also have a plan for rollout of some other behavioral threat assessment um, trainings, um, example tabletop exercises that, that schools and school systems can use specific to behavioral threat assessments. Um, the Behavioral Health Services Gap Analysis Report. So this is a report that was developed by the Department of Health, who is uh, the secretary, is a member of the school safety sub-cabinet. Um, there is a link to that document again in your uh, report. There were some recommendations made on page 35 of that um, document. And I will say that 
Um, several of those initiatives have already, um, or recommendations have already been um, started and worked on by various entities in the state. Um, the annual report is published every year. There's uh, hyperlinks to all of the annual reports over the last five years. Um, and then specific to grants, uh, there's a hyperlink to the grants page. Um, again, MCSS, the subcabinet administers uh, the SRO adequate coverage grant, the Safe Schools Fund grant, and MCSS um, administers directly the hate crimes grant, as well as two grants uh, that are actually uh, Interagency Commission on Public School Construction Grants. Um, so we have one grant for uh, local education agencies and one grant for um, private and non-public schools uh, for safety and security improvements. For MCSS, um, the Safe to Learn Act, as you all know, you've heard me say how excited we are many times that we get to expand our, our personnel because originally it was just two individuals uh, the director and the deputy director, um, but very excited to say we have 15 positions um, as part of MCSS. Um, additionally, the um, SRO and security employee training, uh, as well as training we provide to school safety coordinators. Um, we talked about it in a couple of our meetings where um, you know, we, the, the team internally did a really good job of listening to um, what was coming out of Annapolis as well as uh, many of our advocates. And the original training that was developed back in 2018 and delivered in the summer of 2019, we spent, the team spent um, time over 2021 and 2022 during the pandemic uh, updating that training curriculum. So we have an expanded training curriculum. There's a hyperlink in your uh, document that was provided that will explain uh, those changes in that curriculum, why we did it, um, and what's been added and, and modified and expanded. Um, we believe that there is always uh, new information and new things to learn. So we will continually um, provide updated. Um, training to school resource officers and security employees, as well as our school safety coordinators throughout the state on a regular basis. Um, adequate coverage report. So we continue to um, collect the SRO adequate coverage report every year prior to the start of the school year. The link to those reports um, is again in your document. I would like to remind, I, I think this is really good for the public to understand. And that is the school resource officers in the state are required by law to take the um, school resource officer training that we provide. Um, but it is important to note that there are only 400, little over 400 school resource officers in the state. And there are only about 273 public schools that have an assigned school resource officer. And that's out of 1,400 plus. Um, I think now the count is about 1,427 schools in the state. Um, so I, I think it's important for the general public to understand that not every law enforcement officer that shows up to a school is, uh, by definition, a school resource officer. And um, may not have gone through our school resource officer training. The use of force report, we collect that. We've been collecting that data for three years. Um, again, the links to those reports are in your document. Safe Schools Maryland has been around since 2018, um, and that is the statewide anonymous reporting system. So a really good and free tool and it's free to our public schools as well as our private and non-public special education facilities. Um, and just an excellent resource across the state. Um, I, I mentioned the grants that MCSS administers. And then finally, uh, the critical life-threatening incident reports. So there is a requirement in the Safe to Learn Act that as an, a critical life-threatening incident occurs uh, inside a school, public school, that those notifications are made to MCSS. And Dino is gonna talk a little bit more about um, how that impacts the local school systems. 
Morning. Um, the impact on local school systems for the Safe to Learn Act that we went over earlier, school safety evaluation summaries. Uh, we recommend that their schools conduct a safety evaluation of each facility at least once every two years by August 1st and then re submit that report to, uh, to us. Um, one of the reasons we ask that is because we try to figure out how it plan for grants and, and keep an eye out for things so folks might be able to use in their grant applications. Emergency plan performance report. It's aggregate data about threats made against any school or school system facility, information about lockdowns, evacuations, other emergency responses that occurred during the preceding school year. Anything that takes away learning time is what they report to us. Um, drills, emergency drills, impromptu drills. Everything's required to report to us uh, annually, August 1st. Emergency plan updates. Um, updates to all the emergency plans that have been submitted to our, our office. When we aligned our requirement to from August 1st to September 30 to work better coincide with the school systems and their internal workings. We found that a lot of administrative changes happened early August. So by allowing new administrators to get in get on board into their new schools and then work with their SR, SSCs and their SROs and school security employees if they employ them to work on their plans and update their plans and submit them to us by August, September 30th every year. After action review reports, critical life threatening incident requires a after action review within the school system. So they must notify us within 24 hours uh, if they had an incident um, thankfully, a lot of them notify us right away when it's going on just to give us a heads up. So we're very thankful for that. Uh, they are required to conduct an after action review meeting with one of our staffers in, in the meeting also. So usually it's a regional assigned to that area will attend within 45 days of the after action uh, review. They have to report to us uh, a report on what happened following each critical life threatening incident. After that, we will go through that and we report to the legislature and the governor on a report of what happened. Use of force requires a report of incident use of force on a student by a school security employee or school resource officer. That again is reported to us on before August 1st for the preceding school year and that data is submitted to the governor and general assembly as an independent report. School resource officer adequate coverage report. It includes the public schools that have an LEA in an LEA that have an assigned school resource officer or an adequate coverage enforcement coverage. This can incur as, and they're in the MOUs and all of them, of increased patrols, lunch with a cop, that kind of thing. There's been creative ideas that have been out there for letting the kids and the, and the students and the officers in the beat uh, intermingle with each other and get to know each other. This report is due September 1st every school year, and we again forward that report to the Governor and General Assembly. Do you want me to go into the uh, activities, boss? You're good. All right. So Dr. Moretto-Rano, that is a breakdown of the document that was shared with the advisory board. Um, again, all that document includes um, hyperlinks to all of our reports, all of our data. And I think it's a really good um, sort of one page or multi-page way for individuals to sort of see the progress that's happened over the last five years um, with the enactment of the Safe to Learn Act. So really, again, really great work by uh, the school safety subcabinet, the subcabinet's advisory board, um, the MCSS team, all of our, our law enforcement and public safety partners throughout the state, as well as all of our local education agencies and private and non-public special education facilities. So just really fantastic. Uh, a lot of work, um, a lot of deadlines in a very short period of time, um, but everybody has done a really fantastic job of, of pulling together and working toward uh, really the same goal, which is to keep our education environments, our educational institutions, um, safe for our, our students and our and the staff. So, 
Excellent, excellent work uh, to both of you and to the entire staff uh, at MCSS. I really appreciate it. A uh, couple comments. I'm just reflecting. Hard to believe that you started off your comments by saying this is the fifth year anniversary of the Safe to Learn Act. My notes take me back to just a brief period of time, it seems like, when I was giving feedback on the initial act uh, in 2018. Uh, that's hard to believe five years have passed already. And I'm really happy to hear that you now have scaffold supports uh, for the overall staff that you have. 15 positions, you said, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. That, that's absolutely excellent. And just one more thing for public relations. Uh, I mean, the, it's an incredible amount of information that you have shared and all the hyperlinks. Can the community at large, members of our state, uh, find that on the website? Is all, is all that linked there for everyone that they wanted to? It is. So if you go to our website, um, it is on our legislation page and is it at the it is linked at the bottom. Okay, very good. So thank you. Uh, members, um, are there any questions or comments for the MCSS team? Okay, once again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Bryan and Mr. Pignatero for your wonderful presentation. And there's lots for us to read if we want to follow those hyperlinks. And again, I would like to remind the board to visit the website on occasion, information about registering uh, for the summer school safety conference, uh, which I'm seeing lots of information coming out on a variety of emails on that. And a student art contest can be found there as well. And I also understand that the emergency preparation tabletop exercises are being utilized at an increasing level across the state. Uh, so thanks for all the information. All right, board members, as we continue with our meeting, are there any updates from the board from the board on important projects or discussions uh, or items or new resources that you would like to share with the group at this time? If so, raise your hand so I can see you and call on you. Any comments from members? Okay, it's a, it's a Monday morning and we're quiet. I understand that. And uh, we will now prepare to close the open session of our meeting and move into the work group portion. Uh, board members, as you remember, you've been divided into two group work groups uh, that will be focusing on recommendation 3.1, uh, which was behaviors of concerns, and recommendation 6.1, threats and swatting. I want to thank you for all of your continued commitment to the safety of our schools and our schools and our students. The next, uh, next week, the board will receive copies of all work group notes for the purposes of allowing you the opportunity to be informed and provide feedback on recommendations made by each work group. Additionally, uh, I will ask MCSS uh, to ensure that all work group meeting materials are made available online to the public as well. So that brings us uh, to our closing items in our next meeting. Uh, the next advisory board meeting will occur virtually once again, virtually on April 3rd, 2023, mark your calendar. And the next sub cabinet meeting will be held in person uh, on May 8th, 2023. Uh, we're to the now to the portion of our meeting where we're going to adjourn. Do I have a motion for adjournment? So move, this is Tom. Thank you, Tom. Uh, do I have a second? Second, this is Michael. Thank you, Michael, I appreciate it. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All right, thank you, board members. Uh, you will now be sent directly to your work groups for our digital meeting. Thank you very much, and thank you for the MCSS staff for all that you do, I appreciate it. We are going to record for everyone to be aware. Uh, we were in three groups, three work groups um, in December, and for the purposes of us trying to really come to conclusion, we um, made sort of the executive decision to move everybody into two work groups um, for today. So if you are joining the Behaviors of Concern group for the first time, welcome and thank you for being with us. So I am sharing on the screen just to kind of recap um, for folks. We had a very robust conversation in our December meeting. And uh, the outcome of that was that the group really felt it was important for us to make some changes to the recommendation statement um, because folks were feeling that the prior one was potentially allowing the opportunity for folks to uh, embedded inside of it was potentially behavior threat assessment type of language and work. 
Um, and that was not the intention of the uh, work group. So we had added what you see in purple so that it would read um, develop or expand information materials and training to educate stakeholders, including students, staff, parents, and communities on how to promote social behavior, social pro-social behaviors and decrease maladaptive behaviors. These resources should incorporate student voice. Um, so we had added Claire to our group, and I'm not sure if Claire is with us today or not, but uh, Claire Cabal from our um, student focus group uh, will, can participate, join us if she is here. Um, so just to recap that. So our goal today is to actually come to conclusion um, <laughs> to wrap this up a little bit. So I have kind of some guiding questions to help with that. The first of which is um, to ask everybody to maybe narrow the scope. So one of the narrowing of scope that I would prompt the group to um, respond to is to define the target audience right now for communication. So as we look at that, who do we think if we were to prioritize audiences, um, what makes sense as, so MCSS staff to develop a um, informational bulletin of some sort, materials or training for who, okay? Uh, in order to look at promoting pro-social behaviors and decreasing maladaptive behaviors? Who would be our maybe top two target audiences? Hmm. <laughs> I know. target <laughs> audience? Right, so when we think about parents, educators, students, uh, legislators, law enforcement, right, officers, right, a variety of stakeholder groups that touch school safety, um, as advisory board members, when you think about this recommendation item, where is, what makes sense as the starting point? And I'll actually add the um, recommendation statement in the chat box. So Kim, this is Laurel. Um, I may be off base here, but I, I sort of believe, you know, surely students are the focus, um, but I also believe that, um, School staff and parents are probably observing these um, these behaviors, these concerning behaviors um, as well. Um, not only you know during the school day. So um, I guess that's why I'm a little bit torn. If we have to identify two, <laughs> um, I mean you know definitely with students being the priority, but I, I still think um, parents and school teachers and school staff are in that top tier. <clears throat> Others thoughts? <clears throat> okay, so Laurel's, Laurel's kind of uh, recommending parents and um, educators, our school staff, as a target audience for, again, information materials, trainings related to educating them on how to promote pro-social behaviors and decrease maladaptive behaviors. I would just ask for whether others are in agreement with that. Um, or another option. I agree. I mean, just like somebody put in the chat, I mean, two isn't really enough, uh, to be honest. <laughs> so choosing two, I mean, you just have to go with probably what would you prioritize as the most important two. Um, so outside of kids, like Laurel said, I mean, you know, you have to go, um, 
with educators, you got to go, um, you know, with parents as well. I mean, that, that I think those are important. Yeah, and really, I mean, the reason why we're asking to narrow, to try to narrow, because this is so huge, right, that we, we need a starting point in terms of developing information, right, that potentially then can be used to, right, spin off and, and, and add another, other audiences. Um, uh, yeah, we need a starting point. We as MCSS staff need to know where to begin. Um, well, if only as I believe it would have to be parents. Actually, can you, sorry, Pam, can you say that again? If we're only asking for two, um, my strongest belief would be we have to start with parents and then school mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so I'm going to um, expand on that, then ask you to think about and, and talk to me about what does a product look like then? What type of product um, would be most effective, okay, for a parent audience or then let's just talk about the parent audience, okay? What type of product, method, tools, what, what does that look like to be able to um, interact, engage with a cross section of those individuals um, in the state of Maryland? We definitely have to start small in my opinion, um, something coming to like having a, uh, like a town meeting, but specifically to that school um, zone area, I wouldn't, I would think um, having it more intimate here, we're more familiar with our uh, ministry from our child school. So having it at that, bringing it starting small, then branching. So Pam, when you are talking about that, I, um, I'm hearing what you're saying also is that it's a an in-person kind of interaction then? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I'm thinking um, along with Pam's idea, um, however that interactive um, sessions developed, I think there should be um, certainly, you know, parents and school administrators, but I think there should, the student voice could be represented in that interactive session as well. Okay. So, so think out loud for me a little more about what that interactions looks like. M meaning, so can like 30 minutes, is it a training kind of thing or is it, uh, is it different than a, like, and whenever I think training, when I use that word, I'm like sit and get, right, kind of thing. Um, or is there another method of maybe in person that may be more effective than a sit and get 20 PowerPoint slides? Oh, Pam, you're muted. Well, I was trying to raise my hand too. So what I'm thinking, and it's for thought, um, thinking about well, also if you so again, if we want to incorporate the students, I think we focus more too. So we come out of out of the state and identify with some of the uh, we're talking about behavior concerns. Maybe we need to identify some of our high, our high flyers in a sense, like um, we're proceeding. We, we started this behavior. What you know? What's the beginning of everything? Get some uh, some feedback from them, and then ask the kids. What is it that you need from us? What is it that we're not providing? What is it, how can we support? Everything? Get that data from the students first because at the end of the day, if we have to have some groups. Then um, in, as far as having meetings, um, then you bring what? This is the concern we have. And we have to be honest about our data as well. This is what's happening in our school specifically. This is what our students have said to us. Now, this is we as the adults, this is what we, we need to find his guests. Before there's any training 
or anything of that nature. We have to be absolutely open. We have to be absolutely honest with the data that's going in the building. And then we have our dream spin. Before I come back, before I can give you a dream, I can look at this. And I believe that I'm always trapped in what my parents and they told me to do. Okay, so Pam, your audio is a little muffled. I I can hear part. I I think I'm. I, so I'm gonna, no, it's okay. And I'm going to recap. So tell me if I um, tell me if I'm on point. So rather than uh, so almost like what I'm hearing is almost like a kind of town hall forum focus group kind of dynamic where we create some type of methodology where we're prompting um, adults or we're prompting, we're creating a way for people to bring them together. So I'm also, so no, I'm very restorative in my thinking. So I almost imagine like a restorative approaches kind of circle of people where we're asking those people to identify for your particular school community, what are behaviors of concern and to then use that as a way to flow into a sort of functionality in terms of why those behaviors potentially are occurring to allow that team very local, what I hear you saying, right? That, that very mm -hmm. organic school, organic system to then say, this is, this is what's happening. This may be why it's happening. Here are some potential solutions for us as an organic community. Did I capture that? Uh, for the most part, yeah. Um, That's yeah. much better. Like, yeah, like a, a the broken window theory, you know. So it's kind of going into this. Before we can go large, we got to start small. So, and 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 the beauty of it is, if we're doing multiple ones of these, we realize that there's a commonality. And then when we start trying to train these as well, we are being more um, specific and intentional. Of what we are asking from our stakeholders um, about how to resolve. And it's not just the school system trying to resolve everything. We're actually taking organic input and uh, responsiveness from our communities. Right. Others respond. Yes, uh, actually, okay. Pam, that's better now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Michael. No, I, I'd agree with Pam. I mean, the the sit and get is not going to get it done. Um, when you're talking about training, um, I would say probably the most impactful is, you know, especially from the education side is actually hearing from the students directly. Um, it just has a, a, a far greater impact and makes the work actually um, hit home, so to speak, for everyone. Um, and I think hearing from them and, and gathering that that data and then attacking it from the professional development side, um, the, the trainings at that particular point, you know, take on a whole different meaning once you go forward with some of those things. Because, you know, depending on the kids and those type of things, it, I mean, it's really, really powerful to hear from them on, you know, some of the things that, um, you know, they're going through or have gone through. Um, you know, I've done it myself at, at my school. It's 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 different, you know, and teacher and, and educators can't ignore when kids, you know, talk about these things. Like it's nothing that you can do but really take that in. Um, so it, it just makes the work relevant and real. Um Michael, Laura, yeah. I also like what um, Pam um, mentioned about sharing data. Um, you know, for parents that think it's not an issue in their school or their school community, I think um, we get folks' attention that this is important when we can share real data about what's occurring in our school communities. And not just necessarily the individual school, I'm thinking about maybe some of the feeder schools, you know, um, if there was a clustering of that, um, you know, you've got a lot of, you know, elementary school parents or maybe even middle school parents that don't have any idea what's going on at the high school, but yet their kids are gonna be attending those schools. 
and it gives parents an opportunity to start the conversation or continue the conversation with their kids long before they get to um, the high school setting. Okay, this is great. I, I love where you're going with this. Um, so I'm gonna ask like uh, Tia and, and uh, Peyton in particular also to weigh in here. So this is, this takes courage, what you're talking about. And I've done it, right? As a building administrator, and I'm sure Michael can also share. It takes um, people being willing to listen to sometimes what's hard to hear, right? So um, like, help me think about the way in which MCSS advances that right, advances this, uh, how do we encourage people to hear that? You know what I mean? Tim, are you strictly just talking about from the data perspective? Um, not necessarily. I mean, honestly, the, um, like, right, I love Laurel, right, I, I'm very data, right, like to be able to give, or so let's just say, Michael, it could be prompting people to pull their school climate survey, right, recent school climate data down or data, right, here's a data profile to consider looking at in terms of, again, uh, behavior, right, behaviors within an environment. But I think what's, and as educators, that's, um, not as overwhelming for us to look at, right? We're used to that. What is um, somewhat more challenging is hearing from students. So, so what Pam's talking about, right, is this kind of open forum or, you know, we could do it in a way that's kind of not open, open, somewhat smaller, right? Defined where we strat strategically are pulling, you know, individuals from different groups. But when you put those people together and you start asking the tough questions and, and wanting people to be honest about responding to those, right? That's the courage, right? So as a building administrator sitting in that circle or a system leader and hearing kids share their authentic story, right? Is, is harder for some for some folks to really do. Mm. Go ahead, Tia. And then if we take on that, that approach, the um, inclination of human beings will be to respond with, <clears throat> excuse me, respond with emotion. When it's data, when it's numbers, we remove that emotion. And so it would be very difficult to keep the conversation focused the way in the way that produces some results, because this could end up being a session where we hear a lot of complaints, maybe not related to what we're focused on, and then it, the community or whomever the audience is will be expecting some action based on what was shared, and that may not be possible. So I think yeah, it's barriers and challenges with that approach than not. Yeah, I'm trying to in my mind. So like even it takes master facilitators too, right? When we've done this, when I've done this really well. Um, and 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 that could be, so when again, I'm thinking of the scope of work that MCSS do, it could be that MCSS is training facilitators to be able to lead this work within systems. Um, and, and again, could create like a procedure and a model in terms of, of training and, and helping people with some of that conversation. Um, yeah, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to imagine what this looks like, right? For us uh, to develop a product. And, and I know that based on my comments, I'm looking at it from a, a challenge lens, but also when we have the anecdotal input, how will we quantify that? Because if we're, if we're hearing stories and even with whatever the facilitator's questions are, the, the most well-defined questions, um, if they're open-ended, we're going to have anecdotal data and how, do we, how, how are we going to quantify it? 
because it'll really highlight the experience of who's sitting in the room, not the experience of the state necessarily. Um, it's Laurel again. Um, Pam, help me with this because um, are you still with Baltimore County Schools? Okay, so it's been a number of years since I've worked in Baltimore County and been a Baltimore County parent, but um, we used to have a student handbook. Um, and every year um, that handbook goes home to every parent, right? Parents supposed to sign it, the students supposed to sign it. Um, I wonder if that could be a tool um, I don't know if other jurisdictions have something similar, like a code of conduct or something like that. I'm sure they do. I'm wondering. Everyone if, does, Laurel. Yeah. I figured that. So I'm wondering if that could be a tool um, to look at to see what areas in the individual jurisdiction student handbook um, could be um, enhanced. Um, you know, whether it's resources or more language or whatever, um, since it's my understanding that that's always been, uh, that's been a requirement. I don't know how many parents really look at it. <laughs> they probably just sign it so their child gets that checked off at school. But if we could use, you know, um, those resources, maybe have a, a keen eye looking at them to see how we could expand um, that either into a more interactive um, resource, just as a thought, just as a thought. Thanks, Laurel. Yeah, and that's, 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 this is good in terms of us thinking about like what are entry points, right? What are methods? Um, and it may be, so maybe it's a menu of options, right? Like, so um, let me ask the group then, because one of the questions I also had was that was related to, do we define, so let me clarify and see if I'm hearing you all. One of the questions could be, do we define what these pro-social behaviors are and what the maladaptive behaviors are? What I'm hearing, so tell me if you're in agreement, is that we're allowing that we're creating a method by which the organic, right? The school and the system are defining those um, for themselves rather than MCSS advisory board kind of defining some of those. Go ahead. Go ahead, Pam. No, we, we wouldn't be able to define it for ourselves, unfortunately, because then we'll have uh, <laughs> way too many <laughs> terms and, and not, every, not everything necessarily will apply to each situation. It will have to come down um, one central uh, definition uh, examples per se, but um, that we have to have some guidance and for that piece that we will have to uh, someone else bring down a, a definition. Okay. So others with that. So so what do so let's let's just take pro social behaviors. So in our recommendation statement, we have promote pro-social behaviors. What are pro-social behaviors? <clears throat> Do we need to define that as a definition? And do we define that in terms of a sentence or two or in terms of a list of desired behaviors? Question mark. I think go ahead, Tia. I, go ahead, Tia. I'm sorry. Not a list. That was my only input. Not a list because it'll be, it could be misinterpreted as exhaustive. Yeah. Go ahead, Laurel. I, I guess I'm, I want to think that all parents will understand what pro social behaviors mean. Right. <laughs> we, and we can't assume, right? We, right? we know that it's really important that we not assume. Um, and, and so then I would also say the importance of us really being mindful of the, the uh, cultural bias that is inherent in the term pro-social behavior too, right? And, and how do we um, account for that? Yeah, 
Yeah, I think it's hard not to have a list, although maybe there needs to be a qualifying statement that it's not an exclusive list. You know, we you may need to be a, a such as or a, like um, because it's you know just behaviors that are helpful to your co-humans to you know society, and so you know like helping, um, cooperating things of that nature. But I mean, they may not see that as, I don't know. It's just the intent with the intent of being good, but then we have good, which could have some cultural implication. (laughs) So we're er, er, in this circle. And I would also though, so I would also prompt the folks, I think what can be a guardrail somewhat is, is learning right? Like we're talking about pro-social behaviors that am- allow an individual to be a learner and, a- and allow other individuals within that community to also learn, right? Like, so creating a little bit of guardrail as we define that term with regard to school and learning. Um, Yeah, so I think a little bit more of an expansive definition of social pro-social behaviors is probably beneficial <clears throat> for some for some individuals within the context of the learning environment for sure. Others, Michael, thoughts on pro-social behavior? No, I mean, I agree originally what Pam was saying. I don't, you know, I think we have to have that that defined. Um, if you leave it up to, you know, everybody to do that, I mean, you'll have, that's just not a wise, this is not a wise decision with that. that. That will create a lot of confusion along the way. So, um, no, I believe if that's something that we, they're already coming to the table as far as the definition, you know, it kind of simplifies things across the board um where things aren't as choppy it's more concise so okay Okay. so alice is our note taker so i'm going to kind of prompt alice to make sure uh, she has in our notes that we need to define the term pro-social behaviors um and then i'm hearing that there there may be some value in kind of listing but being clear that it is not an exhaustive uh, uh list there then too so um, then let's turn to the maladaptive behaviors. Do we take the same approach with that? Question mark. Yes, I think so. Okay. I so, agree. So again, focusing on in or sorry, individual behaviors, again within the guardrail of those things that are interfering with learning and teaching, Um, right? So again, and I think, and that's what's like really important, I think, as we look at this, that we're remaining mindful that we're talking about school, right? So we're not talking about necessarily, while we want those things to bleed over into community and life and and other aspects that really um, we're talking about school. Uh, bus, trips, events, school events, right? All of that is inside of the scope of that, but still school related. Okay, so the how, so that word how, right? So this is kind of then the next question is that, so when you read the statement within the statement, you actually say on how to do that. So you're kind of the verb that's used there when I think about the product or the um, what as a board MCSS we're doing is that we're providing something to um, teach, help others know how to go about doing that. Is that the intent? Do you, do you know where I'm going? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying, right? The word how that we have, that we're providing materials to folks on how to promote and decrease. I, I think that is important that we provide those 
um, materials or resources, because obviously that information is not going to be able to be captured in a in a meeting or one session. Um, and for some parents or, or even students that might not feel comfortable reaching out independently um, to be able to have a place where they can go and get more information, I think is really important. Which makes me think about, so go, going back in this conversation where we were coming up with a variety of methods or hows, right? So Pam kind of starts with kind of this focus or town hall is a how, a way to go about, right, promoting and decreasing. Um, there could be a menu of some options, potentially. Yeah, I think um, being a support individuals on like you're talking about the how on, on how you're going to do that I think it's going to be pivotal um just because it, it's a good idea it's like I said get students involved in, in those type of things however if people don't know how to do that it's it's not going to be a, an effective practice so you know whether that is like you said initially Kim uh organization being involved in doing some of those trainings for those individuals before they even get to that part of the process, then like, I think that's where um, we can kind of fit in at is giving them that how some of those trainings. So when, when that process takes hold, then um, they able to be more effective um, and, and get something out of it from that standpoint. Um, Kim, it's um, unfortunate that our student rep's not with us on this group today. It, I just think it's so important that we hear from you know our student reps as to what to they see would be helpful. You know what what do they what do they see would would help achieve some of these goals. <clears throat> yeah, and I can follow up with Claire. Also, right, as, as, as we sketch out or as I sketch out some of this stuff um, that we're talking about. Um, so let me, let me, so this like menu concept, uh, good or bad. So, so I put to again, like uh, all of you, like I know sometimes, sometimes school-based folks can get caught in the, so to do something well, you have to kind of focus in on something and do it well, right? And sometimes what I find is if I give a menu of options to people, they start just kind of picking and choosing and not being very focused in, in, their, um, in their work. And I know kind of Tia and Michael know what I mean about that a little bit. Um, there are ways that I probably could do a menu that is uh, tiered, Right, in terms of, so if you're choosing this methodology, let's go with like a town hall forum or focus groups, right? Step one is X. Step two, right, is to lead people over time because folks, focus groups done well aren't just a one time sit in front of people, right? It's thoughtful preparation on the front end, it's the hosting it, and then it's the follow up, and then it's the implementation of things and probably bringing that group back together. Um, so that that menu idea would have to have would have to be dimensional, <laughs> right? It it couldn't be something where I just check do that. I had a town hall done, right? Or uh, um, the, I mean, the other option is so the other option is that you kind of just build out a training series or um, a preferred. The other, the other methodology that's super um, beneficial is like a train the trainer type of dynamic, right? Which is advantageous when we're doing stuff across the state because you can kind of have experts within the different jurisdictions um, that can serve a role. I know. Think about what has worked. So what is something that you've recently maybe engaged with that has been 
really beneficial to you as a practitioner from a methodology standpoint? I wish there was some means to have an incentive. <laughs> I know that's a big ask, but um, uh, tend to get more participation when there's an incentive. <laughs> so I know that's probably unrealistic, but I just felt like I had to throw that out there. <laughs> Pam. Were you going to say something? Um, I, I love the incentive, and I'm just thinking of some. But I think another piece is, um, I think where, as a stakeholder, where I sometimes feel as though I've, I'm not being truly valued as first meeting says I am, is when there's no follow-up. we got to come back to this. Um, definitely has to have, and my suggestion is if we sat down um, March 6th at the initial meeting, March 6th is also when we tell you when we're going to follow up with you. Well, so we so that shows preparation and planning. So, however, we present it, it has to be again, it has to be authentic, it has to be intentional um, for the buy. In my, in my yep. yep. And Pam, that's, I mean, it's actually, it can be more harmful if you listen and then don't do anything with what you heard, uh, is what we know, right? Are there, um, so are there some current initiatives out there happening, maybe that we piggyback on? It's another maybe way to think about this too. Again, if we're talking community involvement, my, um, my first thought about this is it doesn't matter what the subject is. So maybe uh, we can go to local. So if, say we were having a meeting at the high school, we're inviting them to be the school. So maybe the restaurants in that, eight, that area will donate a free pizza, something that nature that will promote a little togetherness that we can get people oh, or something, and get them all this food, and it may not be the incentive to do what I'm referring to, but something from the community for the community, um, again, to try to strengthen all together, because that's where the behaviors are, that's where the sin everything is. That's my thought, space within house, try to buy into one another. Michael, is there anything happening on the MASSP side of the shop or the NASSP side of the shop that um, aligns with this that you know of? Um, you know, it's not directly related, I, I would say. I mean, there's some things that are parallel as far as, you know, implementation of, you know, large scale uh, you know, programs, um, professional developments. I know right now with the MASSP, I mean, they have partnered with a, uh, you know, private organization uh, for, uh, to provide leadership um, direction with this leadership academy. So it's not directly ran by MASSP, it's kind of a joint partnership, if you will. Yep. Um, but a lot of the resources are provided because, you know, MESSP, we don't have a lot of money. So a lot of the resources are being provided by, um, you know, that private organization. Um, but MESSP is, is, is a part of it allowed to be in a process of leading some of those pro professional developments. But, you know, say if it's a speaker or say if it's somebody that's going to cost money to come in to provide a service to that group that private organization is flipping the bill for that. So it's, you know, if you're talking about also on the aspect of when we're talking about uh, data analysis and those type of things, again, they have the resources to, to provide that in a larger scale um, than what we as a local organization are able to do. So I don't know if that's something that we can look into, um, you know, if there is, a, you know, 
more of an organization that's on the private sector that would be willing to provide some resources and, and help us in this regard, it may be, um, and that might be something we could look into. No, that's, that's helpful to know, right? As we talk about leadership capacity, which is overlaid a little bit, right? The capacity of local leaders to be engaging with their parents in a way, right? To be engaging with their students in a way that hears, right? Is two-way communication, hears what's going on and responds to what they hear is definitely a, a leadership skill, right? Um, one of our things. Tia, anything on the special ed side of the shop, um, state or local that you can think of? Ben? No, not particularly, not, excuse me, not particularly this time. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, so, and that's why, so I really appreciate this group and this recommendation area because it's something that everyone talks about, right? Uh, news, social media, right? At your dinner table, yeah, is something that there isn't necessarily an agency, a group that has a plan necessarily, right? Um, it's an unmet need. All right, so I'm going to ask you to go uh, just back to the statement again. So develop, expand informational materials and training um, to educate stakeholders on how to, and then uh, resources would incorporate student voice. So we've we've kind of made uh, some. We have to define pro-social behavior, decrease, what are we at? Uh, we have 10 minutes left. So can I, um, can I prompt you to help me? Let's spend five minutes on pro-social behaviors. So if uh, group members could maybe just kind of do a shout out, call out of what are pro-social behaviors within a school-based um, environment. As we think about school, as we think about learning and the ability to teach, what does pro-social behavior look like? Anyone, feel free to unmute and shout out. I like helping. <laughs> yeah, helping, nurturing. Including everyone. Inclusive. Go ahead, keep going. Peyton and um, Sam, feel free to help. Non Collaborating or cooperating. Uh, sh sharing. Mentoring. Uh, volunteering is also in the definition of pro social behaviors. Encouragement. I missed that, Miss Getty. What was that? Encouraging. Encouraging. Thank you. My apologies for my mic. Kindness. And so I was hearing you say kindness. Positivity. Empathy. How about persistence for a student that doesn't always have things going their way? Persistence? All right, and then, um, so actually you did that in two minutes. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk about um, uh, decreasing maladaptive behaviors. So let's, identify some behaviors that interfere with an individual being able to learn, with others being able to learn around them, and 
interfere with teaching from happening? Bullying, cheating. Mm -hmm. Anger. Substance abuse. Maybe this is a bit vague, but just, you know, general outbursts. Withdrawal. I'm going to say addiction. I mean, it could come in many different things, but, you know, it could be sex addiction, addiction to, you know, drugs, alcohol, whatever. Uh, disruptive or destructive? Mm-hmm. Aggressive. Physical. Physical abuse. I did want to make a quick comment regarding some of these maladaptive behaviors just from Disability Rights Maryland's perspective. A lot of these behaviors that we consider maladaptive, some for kids with disabilities can be directly related to their disability. So we just want to be mindful of that when we're using certain language that some of these things like aggression, disruptive behavior can be directly related to a child's disability. And we want to make sure that we find a way to address that as well. But I think in the context of this statement and how to promote and decrease, it wouldn't matter if it's related to the disability or not. We still need to decrease the maladaptive behaviors of aggression and disruption. Do you mean ones that they can't control, like maybe stimming that someone could uh, interpret as dis disruptive, but it's not something that this student is in control of. Is that more of what you're talking about? Right. Like nonviolent, but also non-traditional behavior that could okay. be considered disruptive. Okay. Got it. I talked my way through that. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Is lying, lying another one? I'm still trying to figure out how to verbalize what you were just saying in that little conversation with Tia and Peyton. Um, do you want to send that back to me in a statement? So I, I'm having trouble kind of getting my head around what you just said for notes. Sure, I can type it out. Thanks, Peyton. All right, we have four minutes. Thank you, everybody. This was great. Um, so last few minutes, kind of um, final thoughts related to um, any of what we've talked about this work. And, and, and know that like as this hour wraps up does not mean that your thinking <laughs> or communicating back with me has to wrap up too, right? So as you have some other thoughts or um, think of resources, please um, send me an email. Let me know um, some stuff for us to add. Can we add self-harm under the um, maladaptive behaviors, self-harm? Great, Laurel. All right, this was helpful. I I am probably as I I'm going to definitely before the end of the day today try to uh, type out some of what we've talked about in terms of product uh, so it doesn't I don't lose it. But I think I really understand where you guys are kind of going with this. Um, not to say that Kate's going to be like, oh my gosh, what have you done? <laughs> 
we only have 15 people, Kim. Um, but I, I think it's reasonable that there are some things that we can uh, do. Again, uh, sometimes really capitalizing upon resources that are already out there in terms of people willing to do this work. So, uh, all right, if there are, Peyton, thank you. We see that in the chat. Um, again, feel free as you guys, if as you continue to think to reach out to me, I appreciate all of your hard thinking and efforts um, with us today. So on that note, have a good rest of your Monday. It was good seeing you guys. Thank right, you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. <clears throat> All right, Alice, if you can just, do uh, you want me to capture the chat? Or actually, I think Aaron captures it, right? Do you want to stop recording? Well, welcome. I just want to say uh, welcome back. Uh, uh, the meeting, um, this particular group's working on 6.1. I wanted to mention some of you are, uh, we all spoke in the, at the past meeting uh, about this, I, but I know we have a couple of new members because I think we rearranged the groups a little bit. So um, very quickly, I'm trying to see, Dina, if you know, how many should we have in, in this meeting, in this group? Um, it would have been four. And Ms. Bailey had to drop out. So it should, we have everybody we're, we have assigned today that are here. Cool. So real quick, my name's Ron Pierce. I'm the training administrator for Maryland Center for School Safety. Uh, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourselves real quick and, and your roles um, in your agencies. I'm Mike Martirano, superintendent of schools for Howard County representing Pazam. I am Chief uh, Paul Kiefer with Hagerstown Police Department. I'm uh, James Bell, I'm a parent at Great Mouse High School, also a coach and a teacher there. Good to see you, Mr. Bell. Good to see you, Deputy Director from the Maryland Center for School Safety. <laughs> we all I am this. Britt Ayers. I am a regional with MCSS and today's lovely note taker, so bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to test your typing skills, Britt. All I'm going to say is thank you, Britt. Yeah. Of course. <clears throat> okay, there's a couple of questions we're going to work our way through, and I think uh, as part of this, we're going to try to come up with um, some action items. I think that we're, you know, if we're talking about putting together um, a protocol or a procedure for a dealing with threats and swatting, um, we're going to try to put together, put some uh, meat on those bones. Um, and I think I got a note here that uh, Tom Alden might be joining us, but we'll go ahead and Toss out the first question here um, and get some feedback on it. And uh, Britt, if you're ready, we'll get started. Um, so I think most of you are aware of the original recommendation regarding this. Uh, we've been through it, but it's let's go through it real quick. Uh, guidance on criminal and administrative investigation response to social media threats made against schools. Um, that could be both anonymous or not anonymous. Um, I know both are uh, kind of a plague these days. Uh, this should include development of public infographic to explain the process from the identification of the threat through investigation and resolutions. And that's going to include swatting as well. Um, and I think some of the questions we had to get this rolling. So what particular conditions would require different responses? Uh, maybe some examples, time of day, day of the week, um, the origin of the threats, social media, or if they come in some other way, uh, email is an example, uh, or in the specificity of the threat. So what conditions would require different responses. Anybody has some thoughts on that? When where the threat happened, um, I know one issue that we've had at school is we'll have something that happens over the weekend, like on a Friday or Saturday night at the park with two particular parties. But then when we get to school, those particular parties are, it's easy for them to find each other and then it disrupts our whole day. Um, and it's hard to deal with that because obviously we can't do nothing to happen in the public, but then when they bring it to school, it's something we kind of had a hint that it might happen already. 
So I can't quite see what Britt's notes, but uh, yeah, you're, you're talking about the proximity to the school and how specific the threat was. Correct. Change my view here a bit. Um, anyone else have some thoughts on that? I, I think, you know, for me, it's everything that happens in school uh, during the school day versus everything outside of there. I divide it into two uh, different categories inside the schoolhouse during the school day and things that happen after hours. To help kickstart a little bit, one of the questions we had when, when this recommendation, which is develop guidance on criminal administrative investigations, is who would write that guidance? Would it be a team effort? Would it be a administrative guidance on one side, one page, and criminal guidance on the other? Um, we didn't get that far when we originally met, and that was one of the questions folks have been uh, trying to figure. And, and that's still a question at the local level. I'll, I'll say that I live it all day long. I'm in the middle of hiring a, uh, my director of uh, safety, security, and emergency preparation. And that was interview questions that we had brought up, how we determine these. And it goes back to the credible threat again, and who determines it. So that, that kind also of goes back. I think it also goes back to the availability of the local law enforcement agencies that cover that school district as well. Some this, some agencies are bigger than others and may have may have a different response that they can do than a smaller agency could. So I think that's the, it definitely has to be at a local level for that. <clears throat> I think the particular response also would come from any uh, intelligence that's been gathered from uh, around the country or you know regionally when there's been swatting incidents that are specific you know when we know that going into um, a swatting incident here in, in Maryland we may know that it's it's similar to ones in Texas or Arizona or whatever that would also dictate our response the type of response So that kind of leads us to the second question as well. So everyone, all school systems have a, a threat as, behavioral threat assessment policy. And there's usually a procedure that accompanies that. Do you do you feel the swatting is different from a threat um, or not? And then if so, if it is a bit different, what um, what defines it? I, I don't see it as different. Uh, from the response standpoint, you know, it, it's it's coming in as a threat and it may be different when it comes to the the investigation once you are into it, but the actual response to it is to me the same as a, any other threat that you're getting in. Uh, and, and let me build on that uh, with what the chief has just said. I don't view, I mean, I have to respond at the local level the, the exact same way. A threat is a threat is a threat, whether it's swatting or however it comes in. What becomes clear is if, if I put that in as the marker and I treat them all, I'm going to react, then they start going down different paths. Swatting is different because maybe the intel is that we're able to quickly find out that that number, the last one that we had that was a major concern, you remember when I said this, came in from Australia. That's a whole different ball game than if I have a, a more specific voice on the line with a local number. But again, it's that determination. And I like what the chief said earlier about as much intel as we can possibly have to help us in that decision making, because simultaneously what is happening, the machine starts going and social media starts going and rumors start flying and it, it elicits an, a major response and rightly so. Uh, but then when we find that it's non-credible, it creates another set of issues for us. And Dr. Moderano and, and Chief, um, we are working on revising and revamping the um, non-disclosure agreements with all the SSCs and the school systems um, so that once we have these information we do get, we synthesize down to 
what's needed to know, and we can push that out to the SSCs. And uh, Mike tries to push it out to the SROs whenever he can. Um, so in the meantime, have your command staff may want to check with the SSCs when something starts coming around in your systems so that you know, they'll be the probably the first ones to know um, when something starts happening, um, either statewide or nationwide, to uh, help drive how your investigations go. And just to add to that, we the dashboards that are available to the school safety dashboards that are available to all the SSCs have a uh, form on it called the uh, trend. Uh, I believe it's school safety trends or something like that. It's um, basically just a way to collaborate. Um, they can each see what was entered, but if they see some, somebody shares a Snapchat uh, picture of a of a gun and it's directed to a certain school, and then that same picture gets passed around to three other jurisdictions, they can kind of share that information so they know, oh, this is just a rehash of something that, you know, um, to to give them some idea of whether or not this is this is really focused on um, where where it started. And a lot of the swatting incidents that you know, swatting type incidents that we get uh, are just like that. That's something that's shared across, not necessarily intentional from the swatter, the original swatter standpoint, but they they push that across. And for us, it's usually intelligence we're gathering and the investigations we're doing before school starts. We, we get it late in the day, we get it from a parent, um, school's already let out, and then we're investigating it, you know, after hours to, to try to get it gathered and, and concluded before the school day starts the next day. Tom, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm just curious from um, your school's uh, systems uh, standpoint, what, how do you handle these types of events? and um, the threats or swatting? Well, I, I guess the way we, well, the way we do approach each of these is we consider them to be uh, authentic from the beginning. And you really don't make that determination that it's quote unquote, the swatting incident till after the fact. So again, we would approach this just the same um, until we determine it is in fact, just, you know, a situation where somebody's setting it up. But I would also add that I think what's important too is that we don't become so um, saturated that we then start categorizing things as a swatting event when in fact it potentially isn't. So I think it's important to maintain, if you will, a standard of care that we don't just become dismissive that, oh, well, because it was in another state, that it's not authentic or real to us. So I do think there still needs to be guidance or certainly good, good uh, understanding that you got to go through certain steps to at least get to the point to determine it is in fact a false situation. Correct. I just want to say, I think, you know, and social media has kind of changed how we look at it too, just because simple things, what kids see is entertainment on TikTok you know, we have to take serious. And sometimes, uh, you know, we have an instance where people are doing a simple video, they think it's fun on TikTok and they're not being specific about where they're, you know, they're going. But the moment that we don't do something about that or don't research that is the moment that, you know, we find ourselves vulnerable. I guess if I could just ask being kind of in a different circle, I mean, how, how prevalent would you say this currently is? I mean, I'm not aware, of, but maybe a handful of instances, the one in Howard County. and Well, it's, it's like everything else. Uh, I'll go back to mine in Howard County. We had a spate of these uh, based upon the fact that we had a swatting event that came in from, I believe, Australia. And then we learned later that there were like 75 plus of those kind of attacks across the nation. Mm -hmm. Again, I like the choice of the wording. I had to, I have to identify each one of those as being authentic and never being dismissive of any of them. And then it created a whole level of copycats, mm -hmm. uh, almost like the, the, uh, the contagion effect kicked in. And those were coming in from other sources uh, that we had as well. So these bad actors out there give ideas to others and uh, it created a whole series 
of responsiveness for us for about a two week period. Oh, okay. um, yeah. So it was uh, when I think about the number that I've had and, and they come in from a variety of sources. The, the first one is the issue associated with phone calls coming in. And I want to talk about that in the next uh, question regarding, you know, what are those protocols? Because we could have people just walking by the phone and helping out um, members of our you know, uh, support staff from other parts of our staff, and they don't know what to do with that. Uh, so the protocols have to be very clear, assuming that anybody who's a staff member can pick up a phone and take that in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I will just compliment you because you must have done a good job because really, as far as what hit the media that I remember, it was really just that one. So you guys obviously did a good job containing it after, after that. Well, but the, the other point is, and I, and I want to lift it up, how were we able to do that, though? Mm -hmm. Because then we started using the technology and the identification of numbers and saying that then the, com the, the cooperation between myself and the police became critical in determining whether it was credible. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to be put in the position as superintendent to be dismissive and saying, oh, that's not credible. How do we do that? Right. Because just the one time that we do we dismiss it, then that's something that actually is uh, a real one. Absolutely. And we're not going to be able to control the copycats, at least outside of our jurisdiction. So if you, that copycat happens within your school district, doctor, then you know law enforcement and schools can deal with that, and that's how you minimize the the very localized swatting that that gets picked up, but. If it's being picked up by other other actors around the nation or around the you know around the the world, uh, can't really control that. But I agree, all all these come in. They're treated they're treated the same at the very beginning. Um, I equate these like we do any death investigation. Death investigations we do in law enforcement are always investigated from the perspective of homicide first, and then when you realize that's not what it is, then your investigation changes. But you can't go back and change. Uh, if you don't treat it as a homicide from the very beginning, you lose things or you you, you don't do what you need to do uh, to further that investigation. So swatting, any of these other threats have to be treated very, very seriously even in the very beginning. And then you can quickly, in some cases, determine that it's it's a shared photo or a shared you know uh, video that's uh, not regional. And you can, you can learn that pretty quickly. But the investigation still has to be taken seriously from the beginning. Absolutely. So, um, so now we're getting, getting getting into the steps, right? So that's kind of what the next question is about, um, the process and the protocol for responding to swatting um, and threats, basically the same thing we agreed by law enforcement and by school personnel. So obviously different paths, different, different protocols. In what ways are they similar? How are they different? And what information is most important? So communicate to the different audiences, the uh, stakeholders, uh, particularly the public and, and parents. Well, from the you know from our perspective, there's certain things that we want to control going out. Um, if we learn that it's um, something that's truly an investigation that we're going to move forward on, trying to determine who did this and prosecute, um, that information has got to be kind of held a little closer to the vest, uh, so it doesn't interfere with the investigation. And that's where good communication between our agency and the schools uh, and and the the PIAs that be putting stuff out uh, would have to be coordinated. Um, if it's not something local, if it's determined pretty quickly that it's a truly a swatting incident, um, then I think again that communication has to be um, clearly defined both with with our. PIAs and, and yours to make sure the same message is going out to the public. So they're not get two different messages coming from law enforcement, Facebook page or whatever, and, and the school systems um, media release. Thanks, Chief. Um, from the school side, uh, Dr. Martirana, anybody have a, a perspective on how they, um, their protocol for responding to this in terms of communication? 
One of the things that, yes, thank you. Thank you, Chief, for what you provided already. Uh, one of the things that I want to add that I'm really going to be insistent about is making certain that we have the ones that come in as phone calls, and I already had talked about this, that's in real time, somebody's on the phone, somebody picks up the phone, and then what do we want the people to do who pick up the phone, I guess is what I'm trying to say. That's that's the question. What do we know? What do we do when we know what we know is, is my guiding question. So somebody, this is triggered by somebody making a phone call to the school, someone picks up the phone, and then what do we want them to do is, is a critical piece of information. And I keep using the very broad terms because it's not always an administrative assistant or secretarial staff. It could be a teacher in a planning room, depending, it could be a variety of things. So how do we have a very clear, uh, cogent checklist that is consistent uh, for gathering information that will be helpful to us in identifying who it is. So, I, I mean, I'm really making that a point here in Howard County, but is there any state guidance that we should be taking into account that all LEAs would benefit from that? So that, that's the telephone issue. Social media, we always take that from a vantage point of screenshots, and we actually have something in writing in front of us that we're reacting to. Uh, that's one cat. That's a second category. And a third one are these, what I call different kinds that don't necessarily fall under social media or telephone calls. Someone may write a note or write something on a stall in a bathroom. And we don't have a time basis of when that actually had occurred or when that note is found or when certain things happen that we're not reacting to in real time, but we still have to react to. So I put them into those three categories uh, that also require uh, a level of responsiveness from us. I can't, I'm caught up on the word of dismissive. Uh, I can't ever dismiss any of these uh, from my sphere once it comes to my, uh, in, to my attention. Well, and I, I would just add real quick, I mean, my immediate thought where I would go, at least on the telephone call one, it would seem that, you know, and I know we really haven't done it proactively, but certainly in thinking about this, I would take what we currently have in place for bomb threats that come in telephonically and modify those guidance documents that we have to all faculty and staff that, you know, if you're the uh, recipient of this call, kind of a step-by-step similar to the bomb threat protocol, but modified to address circumstances unique to a potential, you know, e whether it is an act actual threat of an active assailant or whatnot versus a, a swatting incident. And, that, and that's a good start. But, you know, I found myself as we were in this moment where this was happening, asking a lot of the same questions, the who, what, when, where, why, how, voice, I mean, lots of things. Uh, and maybe we didn't cover it all that would be um, needed to help identify who this bad actor may or may not be. Just to add to what Tom said, I, I looked at about a thousand emergency plans a couple of years ago, and most of the systems I looked at had a checklist for bomb threats. And it's collecting that type of information is very similar. I think you're talking about a phone call. Um, if if uh, it is, I mean, does every system have that? It's just not maybe not something we regularly train teachers or potentially anyone who could pick up the phone, how to use or how to find. That, that's what I'd want to know. I mean, I, I think, you know, as we're looking at expectations and training SROs and including things, I, I just think we need to give a nod to this because it's becoming more prevalent uh, and we never know when it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think from the standpoint of, you know, I like the bomb threat um, analogy in terms of the protocols. Uh, I think that modification could be, you know, very minor modifications to that. You're you're still gathering the same type of information. Um, I think the additional training for staff is to pay attention to those, those other cues that you get in in a phone call. Um, that you know during that that threat phone call, typically this person taking that is under stress and they're not they're not uh, thinking as clear as they they normally would. So you're looking for background noise you're looking for you know just uh 
Uh, is there an accent to the person that's calling? You know, you use the Australian, you know, situation there. You know, things like that that help us move the investigation forward. Um, paying attention to what comes up on the screen, you know, in terms of, you know, does a number come up? Uh, I know they can, they can hide their numbers now and they can mimic those numbers. It doesn't, but it gives us some starting points for investigative uh, avenues. But asking those, those very poignant questions when there's somebody on the phone, you know, specific, you know, you're, you're saying this is going to happen when and where and try to dime them into something specific. Um, it, it, and then what is the response? Uh, not just what they say, but how they say it is um, key to helping to determine, you know, a lot of times if it's, if it's going to be real or not, or at least gives us some, some way of starting to look at these things. Um, it's, 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 it worked for up here for us when, you know, several years ago when we were having bomb threats and we went in and trained uh, the school staff that would primarily take those phone calls. Uh, and it, it really stopped that localized bomb threats coming from the kids in the schools that were calling them in for the various reasons they were doing. So that's just my suggestion. Yes. Let me add a fourth scenario in there for you that came out of Baltimore County just to, um, and they did a great job handling it. But um, so an email gets sent out to the PTSA for the entire, um, uh, an entire school, in this case, Towson High School. That's how this comes in. And uh, it actually got repeated twice more, I believe. Uh, Britt can correct me if I'm wrong, but when we reviewed that, um, it, it essentially that, you know, it, it went to the public first. So you can imagine their response, um, you know, hand in handling that was certainly going to be a little bit different from the law enforcement and from the administrative uh, standpoint. Um, that's something um, I've seen once or twice, too. So the public gets a hold of a threat before we hear about it. Um, that would just be, you know, just picture that scenario as we're talking about these uh, protocols. I think in that situation, you're going to be handling it much like a tip line. You're going to have a lot of people calling in that they saw something, they hear something, um, and and having both law enforcement staff and school staff trained on how to take some take those tips, take that information. Um, if it's just a repeat of the same information, you're asking, you know, there's got to be some additional questions to get asked, see if they have something that someone else before them didn't provide. Um, that's just another way to help move an investigation forward. It's, you know, 50 tips coming in and it's exactly the same thing. I saw this and I have no further information that that helps in the sense that, you know, it's very specific, it's very narrow to that, that email or that one out um, where someone else may say, well, I heard so-and-so called so-and-so. And then, you know, there's something else on social media that's different. Uh, it helps the investigation. So I think just treating it almost like a tip line, um, getting coming in would be very beneficial and get some training on how to how to do that right the training is important um let's see so gathering enough information to do something hopefully do something with what would be the next step for both the administrators school administrators and uh, school system administrators and for law enforcement I think we're back to the technology part. Uh, let's go back to the phone calls and how the school system tracks those phone calls coming into that school. Uh, getting on that as quickly as possible helps. Uh, camera systems that are within the school, if it's uh, something written on a wall in the bathroom, you know, and you can narrow down that time frame a little bit, start looking at the camera systems, the so school systems looking at those things. Um, those are just, you know, that available technology that schools have uh, at their at their exposure at their their fingertips uh, and getting on that quickly and knowing that's part of the protocol when these come in that notification goes to their IT department to start pulling up the phones to see what they can find so that that information can shared to us as quickly as possible can uh, help determine pretty quickly maybe if it's a swatting event uh, if it's real or not so true anyone else have um let's say from the school side, threat comes in, you've gathered the information. Um, there's, you know, you can, law enforcement takes a step to identify uh, how it might arrived or how, you know, pick, pick how they got it, who might've sent it. 
in terms of communication, the next piece of that question, who's what kind of communication we work, you know, should be sent out to parents at that point. This is pretty early on, right? Right. I mean, we have a whole series of protocols that we follow and, and we are always erring on the side of communicating too much as far as letting them know something's happening because we when this is happening, um, it's it's that really tense space where we're trying to determine what's happening. We start ringing the bell within the school uh, and then kids are sending information out to their parents and then they start the, that whole level of, um, I don't want to say panic, but it is panic in many cases where we're living in a space where we don't know exactly what's happening, but yet it's happening. And so we have a way of communicating that by placing things on our website, pushing out information to the community and making sure certain we have the technology to do that. We've upgraded our telephone systems in our county uh, that we are able to push out an email communication or text messaging communication to our parents. But even then, uh, rumors are flying within the school. But one thing I can't control is uh, the communications going from students uh, to their parents who are then advancing rumors based upon what they see and hear. Yeah, I was going to second that. That is a uh, huge problem that the, uh, the opinion of what's going on is always going to supersede the actual facts that we can offer. And it doesn't matter what technology we use to get it out. It's always going to be too late to actually deal with that. And once those opinions are out there or what people think is being done, um, a lot of parents are going to react and respond off of that. And then, of course, you have to send another message to clean that up. Um, even if you were to guide them uh, with a little bit of information in real time, you're still going to have the same problem like, oh, I don't think they're doing enough. But they can't tell you everything. Like that's that's part of the deal. And the only thing I can say uh, as just being part of the community and listening to the, to, to the people, and you're not going to reach everybody, but um, it's just one of those things explaining the process. Like, look, this is what's going to happen. This is how we're going to do it. Um, you know, your information, we'll get the information to you as, as soon as we can. But you got to understand we have to do this this way uh, in this order. Um, so we can get the proper information to keep everybody safe. But even that, for a lot of parents, are going to run with, you know, what their kids said. Or uh, sometimes it's even, you know, love teachers, you know, some of our educators will sit out there and send something out. So uh, it's, it's with the technology and the instant communication that we're having nowadays, it's going to be a tough thing no matter what you do. Well, one piece of advice that I took from a parent many, many years ago that I still use as a guiding uh, dictate in my head when the events occur was telling, asking me when, event, when an event is happening, just let us know that an event is happening and more information will come so that we hear from you as the superintendent or the school system is aware of it, uh, helps to allay the, con the initial concerns that we know it's happening and that more information will be uh, forthcoming. And, and, I, and I always lead with that when I talk about being in the space of communication because we're all trying to find out what's happening, but trying to be a voice from the official voice, something is happening, more information to come, this is where you need to turn, has actually uh, really assisted us uh, in managing these processes that have so many tentacles that can get out of control real fast. Is there any product that you guys have found works better than others in terms of how to reach some of these folks? I mean, you're not going to reach everybody like um, Bell said, but I mean, can you, does any of them work, seem to work uh, for the most part better than another? I would say something like Twitter and um the phone out probably happens a little bit faster than the email. And that's only because most people are actually on the Twitter page or on, um, on you know, list has the phone with them at all times. And any communication can go directly to their phone. Uh, it works out a lot faster than um, something that's more written that they have to read, something they can hear or a quick response to. Um, seems to work a little bit faster. Taking advantage of everything that's available to you is what we try to do. Saturate the space by using our website, Twitter, as has already been mentioned, uh, emails, uh, although it may not be the fastest, somebody's looking at those. 
and then any kind of uh, text messaging system that the schools have to push out information to their school community. Usually we're working with the principal then to push that message, message out specifically then uh, to their database through emails, uh, text messaging and phone calls, phone messages too. Thank you. Um, in terms, oh, okay, so we've talked about communication. How about what would be the next step? We've, you know, we talked about gathering information, putting something out initially, um, and, you know, tapping the technology to give us uh, more information we could use to follow up. Anything else in terms of protocols we could kind of wireframe here? The same. Thing is, no, I would say the only thing I would say we got we probably need to stay up to date on what's the current thing. Um, you know, one point in time for all of us, it's probably Facebook. Uh, you put something on Facebook, everybody knew about it, even Facebook Live, but now a lot of our young people don't use Facebook at all. They call us old for actually using Facebook. And a big thing for us is Twitter. We talk about Twitter all the time, but then I'm watching some of our young people don't even use Twitter. That's not where they're getting their information from, it's from Instagram or or different type of Snapchat, stuff like that. So I think making sure that we are updated at least yearly on whatever the trend is in social communication. And that way we can send the information out through that particular communication as soon as possible. Um, and I think that's kind of important. Hey, I have a question for the group. Uh, I've heard coordinated communication several times, and I'm just gonna ask, do your individual PIOs work with each other or even um, get together and know who, who the respective agencies are that they're working with or need to work with? Or is that something we might have to try to facilitate maybe a, not a conference, but a, a gathering regionally with folks? Well, it goes back into that protocol piece as far as communications. Again, what you're talking about, um, mm -hmm. all these things that are happening simultaneously. I am in communication with the chief of police as an open line, have my phone glued to my ear with conversations with uh, the chief. At the same time, my PIO and the chief of, and the police PIO are communicating because they're getting calls at different levels from community. And, and then the other piece is managing the media. Uh, to, to serve as a source of all of this. So it behooves us to have that uh, cross communication and link to each other uh, because they're, the chief of police is getting different information than what I'm getting. Uh, so the, it begs for that cross communication and PIOs to be in direct sync. And, and anything that we can do to encourage that or training, I'm always supporting of. All right. So since we're talking about putting together a product basically to kind of inform the public essentially about, you know, how these investigations occur, what we do. Um, and that was the infographic part of that recommendation that came out. Um, what could we say about investigation that um, that wouldn't, of course, compromise an investigation, uh, which is that's primary. But what could we say to public about what, how we're doing this and, and you know, um, or in general terms, what we're doing in order to, to stop the threat, right? Well, I mean, without getting into specifics, because each one's different, um, obviously you're, to say there's an investigation that doesn't hurt the investigation. Um, it's already out there or something's happened. So that doesn't, that doesn't hurt. Um, I say, you know, we could easily say we're using all the available technology that, that at our disposal both the school systems and, and ours in law enforcement to investigate uh, the incident that's going on. Uh, but we're not going to share, you know, intimate information about potential suspects or things like that, because that's where it does hamper. And I think just getting that message out that, you know, we may be, um, we may be looking at a suspect, but we're not going to necessarily say that. Uh, the clear message is that the, um, the students are students and staff are safe. 
and that we've you know we're investigating it that's the first and foremost of what the investigation is for and then moving into the actual investigation to get to a conclusion of prosecution is secondary to that but um, i think sharing that information out that we're making decisions based on the, the information that we have collaboratively both law enforcement and, and school uh, to determine what's the safest uh, safest pathway for the, the staff and students uh, at that very moment yeah i like the way you worded that you got all that right Britt? i'm just kidding we yeah, have I mean, it, I, reflecting on the recent after action that we did in terms of a swatting well it wasn't a swatting incident but it was handled like we've already you know discussed about you have to take every threat seriously and keep investigating and i think that the police um, their greatest asset during that was the term open investigation. And so you can't please every parent, you can't please every um, community member, but you know, time and time again, they said throughout November through the time the person was charged, this is an open investigation. We're doing everything that we can. And, you know, to keep the students safe, you know, we'll keep you posted. And I just think that that was my biggest takeaway from that to the point where I added it into my report for our, for Kate. So I'll just copy and paste what I wrote a couple weeks ago. <laughs> How about naming partners? Uh, you you pulled in every available resource, the FBI, Secret Service, State Police. I mean, they did that in the case of Baltimore County. I'm just curious, any value to that? Do you think that would be important? I think just putting it out as a general, you know, and not necessarily having to go specifics that, you know, right. you're, we're, we're doing that because that's what we do. Yeah, um, absolutely. That, that adds to some... Uh, transparency and also some confidence i believe right to the uh, to the public leave, leave, no, leave no stone unturned right when every available resource the, the other piece um listening to the chief and others that i include early on uh, in the message is there's always some kind of um, reaction from us whether it's a lockdown a modified lockdown shelter in place we we identify that uh early on in, in our messaging and that is um, contained on my website so that parents are educated about what that means because I can't tell them all the specifics but if I say there is an event at the school and we are at a lockdown that's serious and parents know where that information is so they can at least say their children are safe and that all schools are that the school is following the lockdown procedures it has become extremely helpful to us as well. So hopefully they don't all show up and want to pick up their kids all at the same time. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> it's part part of the reason. Um, and, and I think from a timing perspective as a parent, um, I think that most schools and liaisons with the police are handled pretty well. I know recently um, I was out of town and my son was still here in school. And at the end of the day, some an incident had happened in Cecil County and they told the parents at the end of the day, you know, so if my first thought was like, I wish I would have known about this right away. But then my second thought as an MCSS staff member was, but what would, what could you have done? Um, so it's like, it's the timing is, is kind of crucial in sense, in the sense of how soon do you tell them? How much do you tell them? And you know, what do you tell them? Because I don't know, the crazy in me might've showed up had I not had this position for the last year. Um, but knowing what I know and knowing that there isn't much that I can do and the school mitigated the threat as best that they could in, in a timely manner. Um, you know, it was, it was very beneficial to my psyche. I would say, um, you know, as going through the incident that happened in Great Mouse High School many years ago, um, that just the information, I remember getting phone calls from people in other states asking me how I was doing and how they got the information was not um, from schools and they heard from other people. Um, I think sometimes we have to use cheesy sounds and terms like our reactive team or investigative team is working because when they hear the word team, a lot of times it puts people at ease, right? Here's a group working together. Um, but I also believe that you want a message as soon as possible. So as, as much as you don't want that message to be generic, you do need to get a message out quick saying that our our whatever team is um is aware of what's going on the investigation has started and then as dr morano said you letting them know that you know we are on lockdown something like that that helps out um 
and so that parents once again don't rush to the school uh, to come pick up their kids which could be uh, a detriment to what we're actually trying to accomplish at the same time any advice to folks uh to other systems let's say that uh as in the case of uh, Towson, I mean, it, this went on for a couple of weeks, uh, happened in Howard as well with the swatting. I mean, what do you tell parents? What do you tell folks when this thing's going on for a few days now and there's no real conclusion in sight, but they still want to, they want updates. So any advice on how that should be shaped? I know it's a tough one. Right. It's probably going to depend a lot on the incident too, and what's what's occurring. If it's just a repeat of what's already been put out, um, yeah. Let's see anything else on this last question? So well, I guess, Ron. I guess it, it depends on the the public's interest too. If you're getting a lot of of inquiries about it, you're going to have to respond publicly out, and. it's 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 like press releases for us we we don't need to do press releases if it's a danger to the community or the, the community needs to know based on that or we're asking for help from the community or the media and everyone else is starting to put a story out that's different than what is reality so you start putting that information out to, to get ahead of it again uh so in this case if you've got an incident that's going multiple days uh, if the interest isn't there from the public, they're satisfied with what we what we're doing, the school system's doing. Then there's no need to just keep putting it out there um, when there's nothing new to put. But if you start to get some some momentum in the community, whether it's from media that's putting out false information or bad information, and or you're getting bad or false information coming from parents and students and everyone else, and you got to you got to put some you got to put something else out again uh, to kind of re reassure everyone that you're still moving on that and everyone's still safe. Okay, kind of to dispel misinformation and um, potentially if, I mean, the incident I'm thinking of, of course, there were several threats, they tend to be, and as they continued to receive these threats, more questions came from the public, like, well, we're still getting them, what are you doing? Uh, you've got to address that, right? Okay. And we actually, I actually had that situation happen when I was in uh, high school and we had a year that we had several bomb threats come through and actually by i can't know what number it would decide but the public started looking at it like all right here's another one the school got it and schools handle it and that's because the information that was put out by the school the way it was handled and this was before we had all the social media we have now and by the time we got to the last few everybody was like all right here's a routine let's go out to two stadium sit down and the public didn't even come pick up their kid anymore they kind of knew the school kind of handle it. And that's only because of how the school handled the situation, the communication they had with the parents. So yeah, I agree. Once you, if you get the information out there properly and in a timely fashion, the public will gain the confidence and well you do your job. So that last question we're working on is what type of product would be most advantageous? We talked about social media products. Um, that's the quickest way, probably the one everybody has already in their hand. Um, I think the recommendation, let me go back to, to the top real quick, had to do with um, some kind of infographic to explain the process of identification of threat through investigation and resolutions. Um, <clears throat> anything we could put together to help explain how schools handle these types of issues um, and law enforcement as well, um, so that the public knows in advance how serious we take them uh, and what we do about them in general terms, right? Yeah, I mean, I think with the last meeting, we discussed, you know, some of the content for this and, you know, just build that out. And then again, what I'm talking about, uh, checklists for staff internally about it. And, you know, we can contain that infographic, some of the things of which we've discussed here about our communications and partnerships with our parents and you know what we're doing for safety for kids in general on that note uh, folks i gotta go so thank you and um i'll look forward to the rest of the notes bye everyone thank, thank you sir
All right. Any final thoughts on these? We're getting close to the end here for all of us. Um, so for those of you remaining on here, my internal notes, personal notes that I took, I'm looking at possible products, a checklist for threats that system employees can use, uh, social media checklist or social media product of some type, generic, what we should put out, how we should put out, when we should put out, and an infogram, basically going to the general public. Um, if we receive a threat of any type, this is how it's maybe even a dual track of how it's investigated by the school system and by law enforcement. And the outcomes vary depending upon what the investigation leads to. Is that what I'm seeing? Okay. In terms of resolution, because that's part of the question, um, I know that varies a lot by jurisdiction, and that's what I think we probably should stick with, only because we have some jurisdictions that are charging 12-year-olds with making threats of mass violence, even when they can't be charged because they want to say that they did something. And there's other jurisdictions that know that that's futile, so they don't do that. It, how you handle that is really up to the jurisdiction and what the, the particular feelings are in the prosecutor or the juvenile services offices about that. So um i'm sure the the chief has dealt with some of those but and then on the school side of course there's the administrative path like there's discipline that's involved with something like that as well each hey, handle Rock, their, their I, I was just going to say as i was listening to you all talk i mean I, I appreciate that it's 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 greatly varied what are the consequences but i do think it's always good to message that it is a serious situation and there are consequences whatever they may be but that there are consequences you know, it's, it's, it's not a practical joke. It's not funny. It's, you know, somebody could get hurt in response. So just that there are consequences, I think should be part of that um, diagram of the process. And I agree. Yeah, I was going to say on that, especially since I'm in the special education department, you know, um, when we have a manifestation of other kids that did something, we're going to look at the IEP and see if that was the cause. But us looking at the IEP and the decision that we come up with because of that might not be, you know, might not satisfy the public, especially if your kids come to school and you feel like this was an incredible threat. But now we're saying, well, this kid's IEP is the reason why it costs, so we're going to put them out for X amount of days and so on and so forth. I, you know, I don't think a lot of parents can or comprehend how that actually works. And it might be something that somehow needs to be explained or in the situation, but that's uh, that can be an issue too. Yeah, that they the consequences vary by student, not just you know the type of event or. Absolutely, I know I know that's happened several times that I'm aware of, and of course the IPs, you know, you have to you you adjust the response based upon what the student understands, what he knows, he or she does. Any other thoughts on that? All right. Well, uh, Dino, I believe we're done now that we're uh, completed this segment of this. So unless anybody has a final comment, I'll bid you adieu. We'll um, talk again soon, I'm sure. <laughs>